Okay, welcome back. Uh, now we get to uh, jump into another angle uh, in all of our uh, discussions, and that's standards, uh, which have implicitly uh, been part of our discussion, but not so explicitly. So, uh, well, yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, so I've asked uh, I've asked Sahida Barat, uh, uh, who is responsible for managing and sort of overseeing what's happening in the standards world for us to uh, uh, manage, organize, and manage this session. So Sahida, I'll turn this over to you to get started. Okay, thanks, Vint. Can we have the slides? So standards are at the core of the internet and uh, a reason why we as Google exist. Um, we depend on the standards that make the internet work. And standards provide the platform on which we as Google innovate and what enables us to deliver one service everywhere around the world. Um, so if you were surprised to see standards on the agenda today and the condolences from the middle of the room there, um, you know, you're probably right. They, do tend to get overlooked um, as part of the plumbing and maybe because we take them for granted. Standards are not what makes the headlines and so it's very often that nobody talks about standards unless something breaks. They develop through active collaborative uh, communication between experts in the field from researchers, educators, communications between and network operators, internet vendors, and typically the issues are raised and resolved without users of the technology being aware. Um, today we have a panel that um, have worked very closely addressing the challenges going ahead that will make the internet simply continue to work so we and others can continue to innovate and allow an even greater growth than we've seen in the last decade. Our panelists between them, we just learned in the break here, Actually, only just between two of them have over 80 years of experience in the standards development. And we'll start with an overview with, um, of the standards world, followed by a quick look at Google's participation in standards development. And then three of our experts will highlight key areas, DNS, IDN, and IPv6, three issues that have already been um, discussed earlier today, just very lightly. Um, and, and these are areas where Google is active and they're significant to a healthy and open internet of the future. So with that, let me um, introduce John. So, <laughs> sorry, not John, Tony. <laughs> I got confused there. So, <laughs> so I actually got bios for my speakers and decided to create cloud tags for them because there was so much information, such great accomplishments that I just wanted you to have a few minutes to look at these tag, tag clouds. Mm. Well. <laughs> oh. I think that's an artifact of uh, the way colors are displayed. Oh, this is a great, it's a great app on the web called Wordlet, which I use to create these slides. Cool. Uh, um, anyhow, um, you know, a friend of Vince and been around. <laughs> Actually, there's three white beards. No, four white beards. How many do we have here? Um, so um, there's just a couple of slides here, uh, what I called why, where, what of uh, network ICT. The term ICT is uh, increasingly used today so, sort of to describe information communications technology. So 
you know, for lack of a better name, of sort of packaging all this stuff up. And um, this one is to answer the question why we subject ourselves to this. So uh, the, 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 the second slide is really the biggie, which is sort of what this sort of ecosystem looks like today. I, I thought I'd do this. I, 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 you know, I had to proceed it to say, you know, why we subject ourselves to this. Um, and it seemed to me that uh, everything falls into these categories, uh, which is what I call legal system instrumentalities. So one of them is, um, you know, pub public infrastructure requirements, especially relating to cybersecurity, and there are all kinds of mandates that are typically associated with that. Um, uh, to uh, effect services required by governments and citizens. So there's a, there's a lot of this stuff that ends up being mandated for one reason or another. Um, and then there's promoting competition, uh, something ne near and dear to, to uh, Google's heart. Uh, contractual compliance and liability mitigation, which is um, something that's um, sort of in everyday uh, use uh, in terms of you know relationships between different uh, uh, commercial players. Um, they're used in conjunction with, uh, with the contracts that are involved. Uh, and also in this category um, is uh, actually the IETF sort of realized at one point is uh, avoiding restrictive intellectual property claims. Um, and so those are a set of things which is, uh, you can, I think, uh, conveniently put under the rubric of legal system instrumentalities as to why one does standards. The other big category is enterprise and national and regional strategies. And uh, this is uh, the, the first biggie is creating large marketplaces and platforms for innovation, which uh, again would, uh, I think, uh, be one that would be near and dear <coughs> to, uh, to Google's heart. And then uh, the, the second one is uh, what I call implementing or parenthetically preventing <coughs> sustainable competitive advantages. Um, so if you want to create, uh, if you're a, a company and you want to uh, basically uh, <coughs> take your, your pride and joy in, the, in terms of your specifications and uh, infuse them into the right standards for uh, uh, as, uh, as standards for the rest of the world to use, uh, that's uh, that's a, that's a way to do it. Uh, the or preventing thing is is a little. Uh, when I worked for Sprint, um, Sprint actually joined a bunch of standards bodies for the sole reason of uh, watching what AT and T was doing. <laughs> and in fact, I think MCI had the same problem with respect to the R box. So uh, that's it. That's why we said. So, Tony, one thing that's missing from this picture is the word interoperability. And for me, that's probably one of the most important uh, motivations for creating and using standards. Does that fit here? Is that the part of the creating large marketplaces and platforms for innovation? Is that where you would capture that notion, or does it belong somewhere else in this list? It's probably several places. Um, one is uh, promoting competition, and the other is... <coughs> a mandate for public infrastructure. Um, I say especially cybersecurity, but interoperability is the other one that's classically associated with public infrastructure. Uh, if you look at, you know, any of these bodies like ITU that's been around for 150 years, um, they've got it in their charter. That's the reason they exist is to promote interoperability. So the next one is kind of the fun one. <coughs> this is a kind of a classic, you, know, you are what you eat. And obviously, we all, uh, I have participated <coughs> or followed lots of st standards bodies over our careers. Um, I perhaps have been fortunate or unfortunate to probably participate in more of them than many. Uh, and in fact, this chart was actually done in the early 1980s when I was at the FCC and in the Office of Science and Technology, we're trying to uh, 
uh, understand what was out there in the terms in terms of uh, 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 standards bodies. And uh, one of my jobs on the side was sort of follow what was going on. So this was my uh, kind of cheat sheet, <coughs> which became subsequently institutionalized uh, in various other lives like publishing telecommunications magazine or um, being at the IT or whatever. And uh, <coughs> it sort of grew and became ever more complicated. And this is a somewhat simplified version, the, the last of the really complex versions. Um, was done in 1994, and I sort of gave up. Uh, it just became <coughs> too complicated. And in fact, one of the problems here is each one, each one of those major bubbles he has all kinds of sub-bubbles and sub-bubbles. It's a, basically a tree of different groups. And there's a kind of a backplane in which they <coughs> they're all connected together in various complex ways. So uh, depicting that is very, very difficult. But what I tried to do here is organize this um, in <coughs> several ways. One is, uh, I'm not sure if you can read this. Uh, probably not. You're, you're, um, you're, you're trying to on the uh, little mouse button if you can, because otherwise it's Oh, yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, down here, yeah. I literally, uh, so, uh, Trend one, a uh, rise of the specialized forms um, followed by some convergence. So I think what's happened since 1994 is there's been a proliferation of these and then a uh, convergence over the last several years. Um, and that's a subject of long discussion. But uh, one is uh, what I would call is uh, um, the – the domestic clusters? yeah. This is a reading test for us to help you. Yeah. <laughs> we can actually most likely global structures. So, um, <laughs> yeah. so that, that's uh, you can't read it from too close. Yeah. So that that's that's a simple that's a typical uh, domestic cluster. So it's basically these uh, these uh, <laughs> one could call them bottom feeders uh, to the uh, international <laughs> to the to the major international organizations. Uh, and the kind of one of the classics is Addis. Um, this was, uh, uh, I confess, when we were, I was at the FCC, we actually created Addis, uh, which was probably, it, which made sense at the time, because its role was actually to open up the SS7 infrastructure. Uh, this, this was after the uh, dismemberment of AT&T. Right, right. So they, they needed something to basically to open up that process, and it was made very open. Um, anyone could go, anyone could participate, anyone could follow. Um, you know, the standards were freely available, uh, and their mission in life was basically the FCC told them, thou shalt create uh, uh, open network standards for the SO7 infrastructure. Yep. What your, gra what your graph doesn't show is the funny quasi-industry role. For example, when you were making this slide in the mid-1990s, the answer was that cable labs was far less important than at-home's lab. Yeah. Um, that is, in fact, at-home was giving the good housekeeping seal of approval for the industry, not cable labs or anybody else. Um, that's declined somewhat, I think. Uh, but I wonder how much that plays a role in the ecosystem here, whether they just sort of occasionally pop up or do they come back and go away? And well, you notice Cable Labs is right here yeah. and, uh, in a somewhat larger circle Yeah. because they have become important for the entire industry. And very cleverly, the guy who, um, uh, yeah, the guy who uh, headed uh, Cable Labs, um, uh, uh, Dick uh, Green, is uh, – uh, had an international vision, and he like cut a deal behind the scenes with Etsy to have Etsy bless Cable Lab standards, so that whatever they did effectively became global standards. Uh, in fact, he uh, also went into the ITUT, chaired the group that dealt with cable standards, and said, "Well, just bless Cable Lab standards." So they have very cleverly, um, basically, you know, engaged in this strategy of um, achieving global dominance 
Um, uh, which has been helped by the fact that uh, the cable industry basically funds full-time engineers to help develop the standards, and they didn't make the mistake of, you know, not making them available. You can download all their standards, you know, on their website. So they did. They sort of did all the right things. Um, and uh, um, Etsy uh, and the three GPP groups sort of did the same clever kinds of things. After getting beat up, they they saw the hand and the stuff that Vint and I were doing in the early 90s, you know, uh, with respect to evangelizing the availability of open standards. They finally got it, started doing it, and as a result, uh, 3GPP is one of the really major playing grounds these days for mobile standards. Uh, they have meetings every couple months, hundreds of people, hundreds of documents. Um, and they've even spun off the IMS forum. Uh, so, you know, stuff is split between that venue now and 3GPP. Uh, even the doc. Who are the disruptors in this forum now? You know, we were saying disruptor in the early 90s, and, you know, Apple was playing disruptor. Who are the disruptors in the Um, I think the disrupt, probably the latter. I think that this, the interesting game, and it's sort of like the last slide, of, you know, what are the meta issues, uh, re revolves around cybersecurity. So I think that's going to be a, a, a significant uh, disruptor. The other one, uh, interestingly enough, is still, believe it or not, this issue of uh, open availability of standards. You know, SC. Uh, ISO SC27 is, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, security and cybersecurity is meeting in Beijing right now. Does anyone have any idea what documents exist at that meeting? They're almost impossible to get, even if you're uh, uh, part of the process. It's just horrendous. And then they, they turn out these standards and they sell them, you know, for 500 bucks a pop to take a look at them. And, you know, most of them, you know, frankly, probably suck. Uh, and uh, so, um, you know, they're putting themselves out of business. So th that's, that, that still remains kind of a disruptor. Uh, there's another disruptor that I sort of get to at the end, too, which is interesting. Um, there, you know, the, the one is the availability of standards. The other is availability if, of the registration and the information at, in the extensions and stuff that's created by standards. And I think that's going to be a over time, uh, in the next couple of years, a big disruptor as well. Uh, is, uh, and, I, you know, I'm sort of proud to say that actually both um, uh, ICANN, in terms of running uh, uh, IANA these days, as well as uh, the ITU-T's TSB, uh, have been playing a leading role there in, in implementing systems uh, in which you can basically get uh, real-time access to the, you know, registration information. I think that's going to be important f from a cybersecurity standpoint as well. Um, so, uh, but the uh, in terms of the grouping, <coughs> the size is a variable. I've tried to approximately uh, locate these things in um, in clusters of subject matter and uh, how they deal with each other. Um, the uh, the down in the lower. Um, left-hand corner, there's sort of a gaggle of what I would call the forums. Um, and I've got some of them on there, TM forum, multi-service forum, CAB forum. Uh, I've got some uh, domestic ones that are effectively are international, like NIST, a lot of NIST uh, security standards are pretty much international standards these days. Uh, there's a DHS MITRE standards, which are important for cybersecurity. Liberty, Open Group, there's all these. And then, uh, you know, there's, um, and then uh, these domestic clusters are, it's intended to sort of point out that there's, uh, there's these clusters in most major countries of kind of mirror organizations that have relationships with these, with, with at least the, the bigger international ones. So, by, and then in the last but not least, you notice the big circle I have here, app development forums. 
I think that's another really interesting phenomena over the last uh, uh, 15 years. Uh, it was sort of started, I think, at you know at Sun by some of the the stuff uh, you know Eric did, uh, Microsoft, uh, the um, uh, private companies that were big enough to really control sort of major major pieces of the marketplace effectively made their standards open and uh, and created uh, application development communities. Uh, even, uh, for example, RSA. RSA, some of the key security standards are still, are open, but they're still RSA standards. Ben? So, Tony, since you're not down here to ask questions, I'll uh, channel you uh, from the floor. Um, NGN and IMS, uh, strike me as being inimical to uh, a lot of what the Internet uh, tries to do. Uh, but I could be wrong about that. Would you care to opine on the risk factors associated with NGN and IMS and you know how, how effective is this activity, uh, how potentially disruptive can it be? Uh, if it's a serious problem, is there anything we can do to counter it? Uh, if I were Google, I would – yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, I, the inter Well – They are a serious factor. Um, in the IT, e.g., the ITUT today, the, the biggest uh, group is study group 13, which is NGN. Uh, What's but, the relationship between the NGN forum and the ITUT? Um, the NGN forum is actually uh, a kind of a little sideshow of um, where some of them, some of the NGN folks play. Um, most of the real NGN work, um, and these, this would be like a sub-bubble, uh, goes on in um, – it actually started in ITSE Tyspan. And um, then uh, the ITUT spun up study group 13. Uh, ADIS now um, at the U.S. domestic level is mainly significantly, – it was significantly oriented around NGN. So there's this whole – NGN community of standards bodies, and they have a somewhat different view of the world uh, that they're trying to sell um, as the security solution. Uh, NGN is being sold as a security solution? Absolutely. What is this? You got a microphone over there. Um, it's being uh, sold as a combination of standards and relationships amongst uh, NGN companies. And I thought that one of the, well, the really neat things uh, was a document that's actually coursing its way from Addis to Study Group 13 as we speak that defines what a service provider identifier is, or a service provider identity, actually. And one of these, it was sort of divided into three pieces. You're in the club or outside of the club or you're an app developer. And so I sent a note to these guys. I said, um, what's this in the club? Um, and who determines that? No answer. Um, but I think it epitomizes, if you will, uh, the mindset and the potential problem. Uh, while I agree about the mindset, a lot of what we've also been seeing from the quote NGN community is a tremendous amount of uh, internet applications on an NGN base and a tremendous amount of uh, well, let's say the sounds of the sounds dinosaurs make when talking about circuits, and the old vocabularies about well, that was a nice network for research purposes, but now we need to grow up and become the uh, the real data network again, and the things which are going on in that vocabulary uh, uh, are thinly disguised OSI from when OSI was a thing, um, and. Uh, uh, I see this as, as 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 either a rather rather different threat or uh, 
or, or not wanting to be standing next to the dinosaur when he finally realizes he's dead or extinct or whatever other vocabulary you want to use, and at least from my standpoint, uh, the question would be how can that extinction process be sped up? Well, I, it's, it's, you know, I'll say I span multiple communities and I understand the antipathy. Uh, on the other hand, these guys have survived, uh, um, you know, this, uh, this major cosmic disaster, right? So <laughs> they're still there and um, there are a lot fewer ISPs. Uh, so these guys now, um, in a way, um, uh, are in an enhanced position uh, as survivors. Uh, so the, the, if you will, the threat ought to be, uh, be taken uh, uh, seriously. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, they got tons of bucks uh, spent in um, lobbying in Washington and in, um, in very yeah, clever see. strategies to dominate a lot of the four. Um, but I would say the, uh, the example, um, John, is not OSI per se. Um, because OSI could be argued to be sort of new, relatively neutral. Um, the example is, and I can, I was at the FCC when the Arbox and AT&T brought in the Intelligent Network, and the Intelligent Network was supposed to be the sort of the original cloud, right? And everything was supposed to be in that cloud, and the FCC in 1985 came out with computer in th three and said, okay, if you're going to head down this path, um, these are going to be the rules of the road. It's going to be, it's going to have to be an open infrastructure uh, with no anti-competitive hooks. And that's what computer three mandated. I know it well because I actually floated the memo in the FCC and wrote that portion of the notice of proposed rulemaking and then it sort of oversaw the process. I see history simply repeating itself. And uh, I think there needs to be a, an effective strategy to, uh, to ensure that um, a closed um, model for this stuff doesn't become the, the norm. Well, that, 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 that's exactly my concern. And, and I have much more, much, much more fear than I do animosity. Uh, but I was wondering about your thoughts as to how to make what you just suggested happen. Um, that's a, that's a fairly lengthy discussion. Uh, I, and some of it's starting to happen in sort of the Washington dialogue with the net, network neutrality stuff. In, in fact, in many ways that it's reminiscent of the concerns that were expressed when the whole intelligent network thing was floated in the early eighties. Um, and, uh, but, um, there is so much of this going on all over the world in all these major fora. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, Korea and China participate significantly in these fora. And they um, <clears throat> have an, an enormous amount of, uh, of economic power. And um, so that's going to be a significant uh, driver as well. Wait okay. I'm ahead uh, of you, Vin. What? I'm ahead oh, of I'm you. Sorry, go ahead. Um, I was uh, I was floating intelligent network for Northern Telecom in the early 80s, and the really I think is an essential difference, namely that was an attempt by us and the other telephone companies to grab computing away from user-owned data centers and later desktop computers. Whereas this, the computer companies that are going to supply cloud computing are sort of peers of the users. They're not part of the network infrastructure in the sense of AT&T, MCI, et cetera. Oh, I don't disagree. But I, I'm saying their vision of cloud computing would be somewhat different. It would be the NGN cloud in which they basically um, – um, they, they perform all the applications inside of their infrastructure. Right, right. Let, right. let me suggest that I want to have this discussion, okay. but I want to have it after with the other people who have had a chance to speak. Um, what I'm very interested in doing is understanding much more fully the risk and the threat and whether we can do something about it, because I'll be damned if I want those dinosaurs to take over control of the Internet. It's not acceptable. Okay. Um, let me flip to the last slide. 
Um, you have about two minutes. Though. Yeah, okay. This is not uh, all inclusive. It's some of the things that uh, I've been sort of uh, either I see as major developments I'm spending a lot of time on. One is cybersecurity, uh, and uh, part of that is infrastructure based capabilities, in which, uh, incidentally, I would put things like EV certs, um, which I mentioned. Uh, forensics and vulnerability acquisition analysis and exchange capabilities. Um, and uh, there's the uh, <coughs> infrastructure protection, LI, retained data, network management. Whatever you think about um, LI or retained data stuff, um, if you're in Europe, that's a major directive. It profoundly affects the network infrastructure, and you've got to be compliant. Um, but how that's implemented, I think, will, you know, you, there's variables, and there can be different diff differences. Uh, <coughs> and... Um, I don't know why I put responsive measures. Um, I, that's a, I can't figure that out. Uh, persistent, flexible, global trust anchors, I think, is a, uh, is a meta challenge that we haven't sort of figured out entirely, but it's going to become really important as the, the Internet scales globally and ubiquitously. Uh, <coughs> the CAB forum people are trying to deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis with you know, who can issue an EV cert and what happens when things go wrong? Uh, you got the same problem with cyber forensics. You know, who that who those forensics and vulnerabilities can be shared with, uh, when and on what basis. <coughs> and and, uh, and um, that's all uh, time dependent. Uh, you know, your friends today may not be your friends 10 years from now or what happens 100 years from now. I think we need to increasingly think in those kinds of time scales. Um, my personal pet thing, as I discussed <coughs> already, and as Vint knows from sort of, sort of our joint exploits in the beginning in the early 90s, is this real-time access to standards and related registrations is important. <coughs> and the last one <coughs> I think is important because, you know, um, going forward, we need to, I th think, increasingly uh, think of this in terms of a world of, uh, of a China centric uh, uh, internet. Uh, the, you know, if you extrapolate on all the variables, uh, it doesn't take very long to, uh, uh, to get to uh, a state where, you know, the, uh, you know, from a, either an economic or a physical presence or users or whatever kind of measurement you want to use, uh, China plays a dom dominant role. I know certainly from my son who's based in Nanjing, He's, uh, you know, he lives in a, in a China internet world. And it's, um, it's robust, but it has kind of different dynamics. And uh, one of the, th I think, more disconcerting things I see uh, in the U.S. and the West is there's very little, if any, appreciation of, of that. So that's my book. Okay, <laughs> Thanks, Tony. I, um, just a note to my other panelists that that was not seven minutes. <laughs> um, so, as Vince said earlier, I work in the um, research organization at Google and um, on coordinating and uh, leading our standards efforts. And this is uh, my bio up there. My focus area has been on document standards also represent Google at the Insights Executive Board and um, OASIS as well. So um, here's a, a list of some of the standards that we participate in at Google. It's kind of hard to represent all the standards <laughs> on a slide, but um, I don't think this is by any means complete. Um, but they're, it's very important to, to Google, especially um, open standards, as we're strong proponents of uh, openness on the internet, and um, that's also what enables interoperability and the innovation that drives um, Google. So, some of the standards um, have a direct impact on um, how we deliver our service, and uh, getting a standard in place is very important, as much as getting code right. And um, that's something that certainly Vint, I know, has been a strong proponent in Google and uh, driving that message here. Um, we 
have a lot of active Googlers participating and um, we've been collecting information about um, where the work is happening. So um, as, as we go through the slides, I'll give you reference points, especially for the Googlers, of uh, where you can go, but we would love to know more if there's anything missing in our information. So much of the work that's carried out is actually in the various committees. And um, as I started to learn more about the various standards committees and attending something like the IETF meetings, um, I also learned that it just takes a lot of time, um, a lot of challenges and a lot of people, um, some money, um, just the conversation that was happening here over the break was travel, just as an amazing amount of travel between um, participants in the standards world and also lots of disagreements as well. Um, just as um, in Google we have uh, intellectually stimulating conversations where people need to defend their position, um, those are the same conversations that happen in the standards world. And um, the internet standards have a really direct impact on the way the internet evolves and we really want to make sure that Google is an integral part of that. So this next slide is, uh, shows our participation and um, the larger bubbles are actually the working groups and also people. So it's, it's, a, it's a good correlation between um, how many people and um, the activities. And you can see that um, both the ITF and um, W3C and JCP are the largest ones there. And then some of the smaller organizations um, have maybe one or two people participating. So you, you can see with W3C, their goal is to um, through pursue its mission through the creation of web standards uh, and guidelines. And the goal of the ITF is to make the internet better. And um, you can see the sort of strong focus. There's also work happening in um, some of the relatively newer organizations like Open Social, Open Web, Open ID, and Dirk Clinton is doing a great job leading that. Um, over in um, Google Earth and uh, Google Maps, so the Open Geospatial Consortium and uh, Cronus Group. So KML 2.2 was formally announced as a OGC standard um, on April 13, 2008. And in the Cronus Group, we're actually working with uh, Collado, which is a 3D XML file standard. And of course, new areas such as health, where um, the focus there is you know, medical record standards and um, in uh, transport and automotive. And then some of the uh, organizations you might be familiar with, like IEEE, I IEC, and Unicode Consortium, so Mark Davis uh, is a very strong representative for Google in that area. So I mentioned um, ITF as the largest one. Here's a, a bunch of working groups that we participate in. And um, actually, Vint is a chair on the IDNA BIS uh, International Domain Names Working Group and um, works in there with a bunch of Googlers, including Harold Alverstrand, who actually is the Google lead for IETF. Um, and it's an interesting organization in that my involvement with IETF just started about a year and a half ago. And um, I was very pleased to see how open and how uh, collaborative the group is. Um, the, and all the communication happens there through email and, and not just face-to-face -face meetings, although the meetings help fund the organization. Um, everything and anything is publicly available within the ITF, and um, with IPR, anyone can implement, uh, anyone can see the basis of the discussion, and nothing is really secret. Um, much of what happens there is also available and under, uh, you know, a uh, fair, equitable RAND IPR policy. So we'll be covering um, the IPv6 that uh, Eric will be talking about, and that happens with the ITF, and um, the DNS work um, that John Clanson is working on is also within the ITF. And here's a 
bunch of standards that we're active in in W3C. Uh, HTML, Ian Hickson is our key lead there for Google, and he pretty much says HTML is the web. And so that's his kind of tagline. And accessibility is another one that kind of runs, although this is featured here in W3C, um, there are working groups over at ISO, um, OASIS, and a bunch of other organizations. And many of these are not working in isolation. Um, they do actually work and collaborate across the different groups. So this is uh, for Googlers to go to Go standards. This is where all the information is. We've been collecting this for some time. And um, I don't think this will ever be complete. So please help us keep that up to date. And I also talked to the various product teams just to try and map uh, the standards alongside the products and asking the Google Apps team what standards were important. And so here's a cloud tag that showed up, um, open social, HTML, OAuth, OpenID feature very highly, uh, as well as you know the, the expected ones such as um, CSS and um, there's JavaScript uh, and Atom Publishing. So with that, let me pass over to John Clinton, who will talk about his work over at the IETF. Sorry? I have my mind boggled by this picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you did send me a very large well, bio. When, when your resume gets wordled. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I even found out the man took a bio screen. Yes. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm uh, I'm John Clenson, and to paraphrase other people today, I've I've done some stuff over the years. Uh, I refer you to the previous slide. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about the process of internationalizing the domain name system. Um, uh, the DNS was uh, was originally defined in terms of taking uh, any uh, string of octets as a name, uh, but that, tech, that, that approach and that capability has rarely been used in practice, and uh, the protocols suggest a preferred form for names, uh, and that preferred form basically consists of uh, um, ASCII letters and digits and the hyphen with some additional restrictions. Uh, one of the things I've discovered over the years, as one looks at these things, there are two different types of standards projects. Uh, there are those that are basically engineering with technology targets in this area, in which there's agreement about the problem, focus on usability by somebody, and uh, a focus on consistent and well-defined results. Uh, those are the easy ones. Uh, there may be disagreements, but we have criteria for trying to resolve those disagreements. Uh, we also have ones in which the major issues turn into culture and languages and environment. And standardization is extremely difficult. Uh, DNS internationalization falls into that space, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. And then we've got a third group, which is sometimes indistinguishable from the second, uh, where what goes on is mostly about political posturing and politics. And standards work in that area works very, very badly uh, because there are no agreed criteria for when one is finished or when one is successful or when one should move on. Uh, the DNS internationalization work uh, follows that second model, if not, and sometimes it feels like the third. Uh, as I said earlier, the domain name system itself has always been eight bits. Uh, but the applications from long before there was a domain name system uh, have imposed ASCII restrictions. Uh, the DNS has ASCII-specific matching rules. In spite of the fact that it's normally octets, there's a funny rule. And the funny rule says that if the octet has the leading zero, the leading bit as zero, uh, then the assumption is that it's an ASCII character and it gets, gets matched to the servers in a case-independent way. And if the leading bit is one, it isn't. 
Uh, there's no definition specification of what isn't means. And it means that as one starts looking at characters outside the ASCII undecorated Latin character set, uh, matching rules become difficult and the DNS doesn't know anything about it. As we try to look at the domain name system and trying to figure out how to make it more adaptable to languages and scripts besides ASCII and maybe English, uh, we've discovered there's disagreement about what the problem is. If the domain name system is actually about network identifiers, network facing identifiers, identifiers for things on the network, then the names themselves aren't names, they're protocol identifiers and internationalization doesn't make any sense and should be done somewhere else. We keep coming back to that one. Uh, the second possibility is that this is really about mnemonics for things. And mnemonics in non-ASCII scripts make a lot of sense because you ought to be able to write your mnemonics in your own language more or less. And the third possibility is really about cultural elements. And language becomes very important and correct spellings become very important and all sorts of other things become very important and that problem is not resolvable. But that doesn't mean that people don't want to resolve it. DNS is just hopeless. The other conflict about this all the way along was whether to go for a very quick solution, whatever quick means, uh, versus trying to make a solution which was compatible with long-term architecture of a decent identifier system. In different language, that's the difference between grafting some internationalization stuff onto a basically ASCII domain name system versus internationalizing domain name system. We chose the first one. It's an architecturally disastrous decision, but possibly the right thing to do. Because there are cultural issues in this or perceived cultural issues in this, and the people who see the cultural issues don't want to believe that there are any other possible ways of looking at this. When trade-off decisions or engineering decisions are made, those decisions make people passionately unhappy. Some of those decisions are seen as international conspiracies against particular languages or groups. We've often said that sometimes the best solution is one which makes everybody equally unhappy. In this particular situation, that doesn't work. Everybody believes that they get to be more unhappy than anybody else. So we end up with unrealistic expectations. People pretend they like to write the great novel in their language and DNS labels. And they want to use very precise language and very precise terminology, and they want to have arguments about semantics. They want to do language-sensitive matching and culturally local language-sensitive matching. If the spelling rules differ from my country to your country, then the DNS should match those things or not match those things depending on how I feel about your country. If you don't know how to make that work from an engineering standpoint, you're beginning to understand the problems we're facing here. So we end up making choices of a least rotten technology. There are no good solutions. The decisions which were made optimized for minimum disruption and rapid deployment. The people who argued for this technique assumed that we would have universal IDNs two years after the standard was written. Well, let's see. That would have made it 19, 2005. It's past that. There are new excuses. One of the things which gets laid on top of this is people who will stand up and say, the reason why we don't have the internet widely deployed in my country is because we don't have good enough IDNs or we don't have top level IDNs or we can't spell properly in IDNs yet. What their excuse will be when they get that, I don't know, but I'm sure there will be one. And as a consequence of those decisions, all of this work gets done in the applications and not in the DNS. Decisions which were made in 2002-2003, I said all the work was going to be done in the applications, that nearly any Unicode character in Unicode 3.2 is going to be permitted, that we were going to solve problems by mapping many characters into other characters at the applications layer. The rules are based upon some Unicode operations, 
but ultimately the tables are unique to IDNA, unique to this particular standard. That means that if you have a set of rules which deal with Unicode elsewhere in your application, those rules are guaranteed to be different than the rules used for IDNs. Once one gets through doing that particular mapping process, which in, it, in, in the process legitimize characters which could not be typed on terminals anywhere in the world, because they mapped it to something else which maybe could, legitimized symbols, line drawing characters, punctuation, dingbats, we ended up with things that don't display consistently across the world, which cannot be typed consistently across the world, valid in domain names, sort of. Once one gets to those strings, the result is mapped into an ASCII compatible form, which looks like the, to the DNS, like letters, digits, and a hyphen, or two. And the assumption is that that's a good idea because Unupgraded applications think it's an ordinary domain name label. And then you end up with a bunch of rules that have to, about how it's going to be displayed. And the other interesting decision about that display process is that the rules ignored every operating system I know of from Multex forward. In most of our languages and operating systems, if you want something displayed, you call a routine and you say, display this. And the routine does not come back to you and say, I have no way of representing that particular character because it doesn't know. But the assumption was that we could take these things in and convert them back to something which wasn't necessarily what the user typed and pass it out to the screen and have it rendered. Maybe. All of this had some unanticipated effects. One of the unanticipated effects, in addition to that bad assumption about operating systems, is that when you move from worrying about circa 90 characters to circa 100,000, a lot more things look like a lot of other things. And bad guys figure that out. Gee. So the people who developed the applications decided they had to protect their users from this nonsense. And naturally enough, they overreacted. So now we've got a layer on top of the protocol which starts applications, web browsers, and other things, figuring out what it's safe to display. And if they decide something is not safe to display under criteria which are basically different for every web browser out there, they display the internal ACE form. And what that does to a user who says, I always want to be able to write my name in its correct spelling in a DNS label, that user gets the improvement from a miserable ASCII transliteration of that name to a totally unintelligible and unpronounceable coded string. And for some reason, that's not considered an improvement. In addition to that, this raises a whole series of policy issues. What we've had since the beginning of the DNS is guidance to people who are managing zones, or in our later terminology, operating registries, that says probably you shouldn't register anything in the DNS which doesn't consist of letters, digits, and hyphens with those rules, unless you have some specific reason for doing so, because the applications won't handle it. But the enforcement has been strictly a registry matter, plus the application enforcement of, if you don't follow the rules, it won't get through SMTP and other things. As we move to this other set of characters, we end up with policy issues of a similar nature. And those policy issues get interpreted by every registry on the internet potentially differently, all tens of millions of them. So the registrant or user who expects consistent behavior or the application which expects consistent behavior is in very big trouble. And especially very big trouble because of all of these interesting mapping rules. So we're now trying to drain the swamp. And we're doing it, unfortunately, with an eyedropper. We are working on a new version of IDNA. Right. <laughs> 
it would be faster, but distasteful. Uh, we've had an old rule that 10% of certain problems takes 90% of the work. With this work, it's turned out that 2% of the problems takes 95 to 98% of the work. What we're trying to do is ultimately a few small simplifications. We're trying to get this notion that if you have a character in Unicode, you should be able to write it in DNS, back to the notion that maybe that 1971 letters, digits, and hyphens rule really ought to be extended into this space so it's letters and digits and very little else in these names. The code word for that is an inclusion-based model versus an exclusion-based model, if you hear those terms. We're trying to get rid of the mappings so that the coding from the internal form to the external form is reversible. So the user types something in, it gets converted to the internal form, it gets converted back, it is actually what the user expected to see. For some reason, users like that. We're trying to make a few more languages useful. There's some coding rules in the old thing which completely eliminated the possibility of using a couple of languages and scripts. And we're trying to clean up a few other details. In a perfect world, that would take about two weeks. We're about two years into that two weeks. And we're still having the old arguments about natural language, about novel writing, about words, about matching rules. <clears throat> we still have the nasty policy problems that will get solved in inconsistent ways. There's no way to make them go away in this world. And we're discovering a new problem, which is that every bug and design misfeature in the original version is now a feature which people are arguing has to be preserved because somebody used it. And that includes not only the misfeatures of the design, but the decisions which various implementations and implementers made to exceed the standard and move beyond it in ways which show up in files and are supported by at least some browsers. That's an important general problem because in a world where somebody says, well, somebody violated this standard and somebody else decided to support their violation and therefore it can never change, is a world in which one can never make progress. And I don't know what one does in that world. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we have two more speakers to go. So we will do questions at the end. But you know where to find me if you don't get a chance otherwise. <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, my name is Tina Dam. I work for ICANN, and uh, I'm in charge of IDNs at ICANN. Um, I've been at ICANN for about six years, and only the last couple of years my sole focus has been on IDNs. So you can imagine I don't count that much in the number of the 80-year uh, experience of the entire panel, but in any event... Um, when it comes to ICANN and IDNs, uh, we look to the IETF for technical standards, and particularly, as John has talked about, the IDNA um, is the most important one. There also is a couple of other technical standards that become important when it has to do with implementation and functionality of IDNs, at least one of which is uh, currently missing, which you'll see in a little bit. I just have a couple of slides, and I'm going to try to be brief because... Uh, we need more time for questions, I think. Um, since we're a little bit of a diverse group, I just thought, um, yeah, I just thought I would make sure that we're sort of like on the same page. Um, the first version of the IDNA protocol came out in 2003, and what that means is that we actually have had IDNs um, existing since 2003 under the technical standards for web protocol. The email clients are uh, is something that we're beginning to see, which is under experiment, experimental uh, implementations. Um, but everything on in the domain name space is, has so far been on the second level. And um, because of that, the focus within ICANN is now to get IDNs at the top level. 
that creates some challenges since the protocol is under revision at the same time, as you'll see in a little bit. Um, the little box there is just a further illustration of what it is that we have and what we're going towards. I'll say um, probably slightly more positive than, than John has been saying that IDNs actually have existed um, and functioned really well um, for lots of um, different language communities, but particularly those that are basing their languages on the Latin script or the extended Latin script. So when you move into something like uh, Korean, Chinese, Arabic, or so forth, they don't have as much um, experience or implementation experience as you see in the Latin and extended Latin script because of the fact that you have to change the script when you type things in. I mean, it becomes more difficult, right? One thing is that for Arabic speakers that you have to type things in, in ASCII or Latin today. Um, another thing is if they have to switch between the two. So they're waiting for the top level. They're waiting for the entire string to be in their um, script or language, if you want to um, talk about it that way. Um, we have actually had the IDN TLDs in the root since 2005, September. Um, dot test 11 strings were put in the root just to see how it worked, and uh, they work fine. Um, I can show you some more pointers to it where you can find it if you're interested. But in any event, the top level, um, we have um, three processes. Uh, the middle one here is something that's under policy development, so I'm not going to talk a lot about that. That's for CCTLDs for long-term, internationalized versions of that. But the top one and the bottom one, um, the top one is what we typically refer to as fast track, and it's for internationalized country code top-level domains. It's a limited round. It's intended to be faster than this uh, middle one uh, that's under policy development. This is not expected. The policy of this is not expected to be finished um, until at least a couple of years still. So the fast track is to give those countries and territories that are ready and really have an express need, you know, what they're looking for. Non-Latin script only, matching the ISO 3166 list, and the string that's applied for and potentially becomes a label as a TLD um, much, must match the country or territory name. So there is a lot of different restrictions in there. Um, the bottom process is new GTLDs, and that can be internationalized as well. Um, the main thing to say about that, um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the implementation of that process. Um, the main thing to say, I think, is that from an IDN perspective, an IDN GTLD or an IDN CCTLD is essentially the same thing from a technical point of view. There is no difference between the two. And because of that, the technical requirements are also the same in those two processes. I'm not going to talk much more about the GTLDs per se. I mean, we've had a couple of rounds at ICANN implementing new GTLDs. This next round is intended to be a much larger round that will continue rolling. So it's not a, a one-off uh, implementation. Um, but it doesn't really have much to do with the standards as this panel is talking about. So this um, is my last slide. And it's basically just to give you a quick overview of what I believe are the main technical issues we have ahead in getting this finished. Um, and it goes both for CCTLDs and GTLDs. Um, the first one, and they're not in any particular order, the first one is vari variant allocation or blocking. What do we do with these variant top-level domains? At second level, we have different approaches. Some are allocating, some are blocking, some give out all variants for one price and so forth. There's all kinds of different models, but what do we want to have in the root? Um, I put up a couple of examples, and I should say right away that neither China nor Pakistan have said this is what we want publicly. They've said this is what we're interested in, but you know, we, ICANN has not opened for applications yet, so none of this is formal. They've said publicly, this is what we're interested in. Um, you can see the difference between the two strings for China. They both mean China. One is simplified Chinese, the other is traditional Chinese. The one for Pakistan, you probably can't, or at least you shouldn't be able to. Um, 
I'm sorry? Is there a ZWNJ in high school? No. Um, What's the difference? The difference is I can't reach that, but um, <laughs> I thought I could. I usually can. Uh, can I use this? Where am I? Oh, here we go. This character that kind of look that looks a little bit like an S. Yeah, I mean, if you're an uh, English native speaker anyways, um, is actually two different characters. One is used primarily if you're in Saudi Arabia. Um, the other is used um, for most other speakers in Pakistan. So there are two different ones. So there are two different Unicode characters, oh. different Unicode code points. Um, so obviously the string becomes different in the DNS, even though you can't see the difference. So what do we do with those things? Um, and here is the uh, technical standard that doesn't exist that I mentioned early on. Um, we don't have a technical solution to alias them because obviously you would want those, if, if those two existed as TLDs in the root, you would need them to be aliased. I mean, they would need to be the same thing, right? I can't have Tina.1 and then one of you have Tina. the other one. It, I mean, you can't, it's the same, it looks the same, right? So, um, so that's an open topic um, that's being discussed right now. The other one um, is number of characters in a label. And I can see my, uh, the little square there was supposed to be an error. Uh, on a PC, it's an error, I guess. So for CCTLDs, we're used to having two characters in a label. Um, and now that we're opening up for the fast track, you can have a whole country name. So you can have actually very long strings. And in any event, because they're IDNs and they get converted to XN dash dash in the IDNA protocol, they're longer, they're longer than two characters, right, obviously. In GTLDs, we've been used to seeing three plus characters. Um, early on, I guess mostly just three characters, but now we're getting more used to three plus. We've all seen the acceptability and usability problems of that. My personal email address is under .info. Um, it doesn't always work. Um, things like that becomes problems when you look at standards. Question mark is what I put after the GTLD list is in the new process, do we see one character GTLDs, you know, at the top level extension, two character, three character, and three plus character? And while this is something that's more related to how do you implement this process wise and what can people apply for, it still is a technical issue when you look at the namespace and how things are, are working and functioning. And, and what we're used to seeing. Um, so both from an application space, but also from a user um, experience space. Third topic is the IDNA technical standards revision that John talked about. Um, and this is difficult, right? I mean, ICANN has been asked many times, what are you gonna do if you're ready to launch these two processes to implement, implement new TLDs and the IDNA protocol revision is not finished? Are you just going to take out IDNs and say, well, fast track disappears completely, right? Because it's only IDNs. GTLD, should it only be ASCII? Um, and so far, our position on that is that um, we do have a technical standard and it is working. So we are going to go ahead, but we're going to proceed cautiously and add some more technical requirements around what strings we're going to allow into root. Um, but that relates into timing. And that's quite a difficult topic as well. The fast track is expected to launch around um, sometime in Q4 2009. The new GTLD applications process um, is anticipated to launch in Q1 2010. And there is no fixed deadline for either one of them. But that's coming up really soon, right? And when we talk about a protocol revision that's underway, well, we're not just talking about the technical standard being finished. We're talking about getting it implemented into these processes, getting it implemented into applications so it actually works for the users. So you can talk about different layers of um, when is this all going to work. And if we were to wait at ICANN until technical standards are implemented I don't know what to call it broadly in applications. Well, we would wait forever, right? So for me, it's more of the chicken and the egg. And I believe that 
the user have a lot of power in this. And I think the user, when they see wrong, difficult, faulty behavior in some applications, they're going to move to others that are more secure. Um, but unless we hold back and we don't move forward, you know, nothing is never going to progress and it won't take us anywhere. So, um, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be difficult um, to do something without that revision to be completed, but um, that's where we stand today. So that's all I had. Is that, what is it, about seven minutes? Maybe, a little more. I can talk about IDNs forever, so I'm sorry. Um, and I like being part of the, or a new member of the standards body, even though there was uh, condolences early on. <laughs> Peter, just very quickly, if, if, if you had a rich enough set of fonts, not only would those two characters display differently because they have different code points, but so would several of the other characters which have the same code point. Yeah, so, and just to, like, a quick feedback on that. I mean, there's a lot of topics on this that I didn't touch on at all. Um, there's the fonts, there's all kinds of other stuff in the application layer. There's guidelines that are not technical standards, but sit on top of the technical standards. There's the registries, there's, you know, multitude, and I'm happy to talk about any of it with anybody that is interested in more on IDNs. So we can look forward to Dingbats and Zap Chancery uh, domain names? Is that what you're telling me? Uh, not if I can help. It. Right, yeah, cold day in hell, right? All right. Um, my name is Eric Eric Klein. I work uh, some IPv6 for Google, thanks to Vint Cerf and Stephen Stewart and Lorenzo Coiti. And uh, so I'm going to try to take my seven minutes here and give it to that. So um, just I don't know how much of this I really need to go into, uh, why we were sort of doing IPv6, the costs here. Are not necessarily costs, by the way, that are accrued to us. There are costs uh, running IPv4 that will continue to increase, buying um, carry-grade NAT devices, buying public addresses. These costs are only going to increase. And uh, most likely, this, this affects ISPs more than it will us. But uh, it'll affect our users. The opportunities here are actually uh, actually quite a lot of them. And uh, I just there, there's an operational simplicity to not having to deal with NAT that's really, really nice. There's um, several million devices that are IPv6 only right now that we can talk to. Um, there are several million devices that are IPv6 only that we can't talk to because they're in walled gardens. But uh, if, the walled garden, if the walls come down, then we'll have multiple millions of more devices. Um, we can also do crazy things like uh, there was talking earlier about uh, SSL and then also um, cloud computing. We could assign every single app engine uh, application its own 64-bit host ID. And every, it could have its own unique address at every single data center that we run, and it could have a SSL cert for every single app. It would be no problem whatsoever with a space that large. And if we ran out of two to the 64 applications, we would just remove you know, one bit from the network and <laughs> do it all over again. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of uh, personal interest in keeping the uh, uh, internet open and not wanting to have things locked down. We don't know what the next great application is, but we want to uh, be ready for it. So, and of course, it, it serves our users. It behooves us to uh, take uh, measures we can now so we don't have to worry about it later. A very, very brief history, um, not terribly, well, it's an eye chart. <laughs> uh, but in uh, December at IETF 70, Mark Townsley said, well, I don't know what to do about IPv6. Maybe we'll just challenge Google to have IPv6 by IETF 73 in November of 08 uh, when they're hosting it. And uh, I sent email off from the plenary floor. And uh, in January, we served our first Google over IPv6 query. And we had ipv6.google.com by March for the IPv4 blackout hour because IPv4 blackout hours were somehow very popular, although very painful. And uh, we followed it up by having our first, uh, we served Google over IPv6. We served quad A's for www and mail and uh, a few other things uh, to IETF 73. And actually, while I was there, Eric Vink from uh, Cisco was like, oh, you're Eric Klein. I was just doing some TCP dumping on my Mac, and I was saying, wow, somebody's going to Gmail over IPv6. Who's that? And then I TCP dumped some more, and then uh, I realized it was me. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, I didn't really remember him, so when I ran into Eric Vink uh, in January of uh, 09 at, uh, in Barcelona at Cisco Networkers, I told him that same story, and he says, yeah, that was me. <laughs> and uh, 
we announced the Google of RP6 program in January, and uh, we had a conference uh, recently, a couple uh, weeks ago, uh, and we added uh, map tiles, actually, which gave us this nice little 3x increase in traffic in about uh, a few minutes. Um, some IETF things that we're sort of following, uh, believe it or not, NAT is probably, possibly coming into IPv6. Um, there's a lot of passionate debate about this. Um, <laughs> I have my own thoughts, obviously. Uh, VRRP is something we're interested in. Uh, I can only find um, a couple of de uh, two two uh, dead drafts. So, but uh, the convergence of uh, not wanting to wait for neighbor unreachability discovery for when a router goes down to uh, to uh, keep the TCP, uh, uh, TCP flow would be great. Uh, most important for us actually probably are, are the non-native access and transition methods, methods that people are working on. Uh, NAT 6 to 4, including the DNS 6 to 4 component. 6RD we like. We have um, a million and a half or more um, IPv6 users in France, two and a half million. Uh, and they're all 6RD users. Uh, we want to see that one uh, pushed to be a standard as well. And we have a few other things that we track. Uh, this is just um, IPv6 things. Obviously, there's a great deal more. So we, uh, we've been running an experiment to see what connectivity is like. Um, about a third of a percent <laughs> of the Internet uh, is actually capable of doing IPv6. Um, and about a tenth of a percent will actually break if we uh, add a quad A to www.google.com. These numbers are kind of, um, especially the, the brokenness number, that's a very difficult number to, to measure. I would take that with a grain of salt. Suffice it to say, it, uh, it has an impact that we're not really uh, willing to risk just yet. So uh, here's uh, growth over time. It uh, amounts to about 0.1% increase every eight months. So uh, we'll be done in about 8,000 months. So it's all, it's all good. We're on time. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, well, you know, it's quite possible. Comcast has a, has a large deployment that they're in the middle of doing. Um, if we can actually get to the uh, NTT devices, every single home uh, in NTT has a uh, fiber to the home has a slash 48. So uh, we can get to a great number of devices in theory. Uh, we've been monitoring how users get to us. Unfortunately, about two-thirds of them get to us over 6 to 4. Um, and various other statistics I won't uh, go into. We launched Google over IPv6, of course, and you can go to the website and see these really neat graphics about how if your DNS resolver is uh, in our whitelist, we'll serve you quad A's. Otherwise, you look just like the rest of the Internet, and we don't because we don't want to break you. Uh, and this is actually probably the, uh, this is the last slide, and um, is a, a graph courtesy of David Luyer. There's um, actually four lines to look at. The top one, very faint, is, a, is all of the search uh, over uh, IPv6. And the next blue one below it, the darker blue one, is the same with 6 to 4 in Teredo, tunneling mechanisms removed. The red line is actually two red lines. Those are IPv6 searches of uh, Google over IPv6 users people who are actually enrolled in our program. And you'll notice that there's another line that, that is with Tunnel and 6 to 4 removers, uh, sorry, with Teredo and 6 to 4 users removed. And we have no Teredo and 6 to 4 users by design or virtually none. So uh, you can see that we currently have about two thirds, three quarters of the IPv6 internet enrolled in Google over IPv6. We have some uh, peering arrangements and other things that are coming up and we're seeking out the ASNs that, that connect to us to figure out how we can serve those. Uh, and so, yeah, we'll grow Google over IPv6 until we serve all of the IPv6 internet, but uh, we're not really seeing the IPv6 internet, the size of the IPv6 internet growing yet. So, but. Can I say more about Google over IPv6 rules? You mean like what, uh, what qualifies? Who's allowed to do that or what's, what are the criteria? Oh, sure. Uh, it's essentially um, production quality IPv6 connectivity between us and them. Preferably two paths, preferably um, uh, no tunnels. Is that correct, Stephen? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's mandatory. Yeah, and you have to commit to um, production quality IPv6 support. You have to treat an IPv6 outage with the same degree of uh, severity you would treat an IPv4 outage. And you have to be willing to troubleshoot uh, problems when your users report them. Uh, and we're happy to uh, and willing to work with anybody uh, if problems are reported but uh, they have to be willing to take those support calls as well. So we've had um, great success. We've got like 50 organizations. We have about 250,000 unique IPv6 addresses per day that we see. Um, so 
lots of universities, Department of Defense Research and Engineering Networks, um, places in uh, lots of places in Europe. I think we're still bringing up a few places in Asia. It depends on network build up. But yeah, is that under seven? All right. Hopefully, I didn't sound like a uh, legal disclaimer at the end of a radio ad. So if we can just have all the panelists out at the front, we've got time for Q&A. So. I have uh, mixed feelings about internationalized domain names because on one hand, they uh, make um, uh, internet available to various populations that are not literate in uh, latent scripts, but on the other hand, they result in more balkanization of the internet. And uh, for the rest of humanity, so to say, it becomes kind of a bold garden. So what is your take? Is it a net positive or net negative effect in terms of, in, uh, in terms of global impact? It certainly is. <laughs> um, my, it's, it's going to be immensely useful, it, it, it and some other internationalization efforts, which are more or less related, are going to be immensely useful for getting communities that are not now connected well enough to communicate with anybody, communicating among themselves. Uh, I... I refuse to think of that as balkanization because I think it ultimately open. I, I think that kind of thing ultimately opens things up. Uh, at the same time, the optimism behind all my pessimism and cynicism about this is that I think that there are lots of people who have expectations for problems that IDNs are going to solve. That as these things deploy, people will figure out that they do not solve, and what I say in other forums and might as well say here is the problems which this stuff is going to cause because of difficulties in matching because of some of these other things sort of cause Google in the sense that users today, much more so than even we anticipated a half a dozen years ago, are going to the search engines because it's getting harder and harder to try to guess domain names. This internationalization stuff is going to drive that problem up astronomically. And as a consequence, my guess is that what we will see once this settles down, no predictions how long that'll take, is things returning to where philosophically they arguably belong, which is domain names being used as, 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 as mnemonics and network facing identifiers and much more use of search engines, intentionally populated directories, and a whole series of other things at that closer to the user layer where you can actually do semi-linguistic things for the user level stuff. And it's probably unfortunate that we have to waste the amount of time and resources that will go into doing this exercise to get there. But I think this will sort itself out. And I don't see a balkanization problem for that reason, but it doesn't have to do with the IDNs themselves. They're sunk. Okay, I'm just going to make a quick addition to John's. John, John and I actually um, agree on most things, and we almost also agree on this one. I'm going to say that I think it already is useful. IDNs are already useful, and they're going to continue to be useful. I also don't see balkanization. Um, so on top of John's... Um, uh, argument for why. Let me give you an example of it. Um, what if you have a website that contains, let's say, solely Arabic content, and in a school in one of the Arabic-speaking nations, um, the kids are told to go and check out this website and do some uh, homework or study or research or you know whatever level of school you're in, university or smaller classes, they're told to go to this website. Well, the website address is in ASCII characters. That makes no sense to me. And, and enabling that address in Arabic characters is not balkanizing anything. It's just making it more accessible and usable for that particular um, 
community who would go to that site. Uh, you're not losing a sense of global community to anybody who is now part of that community for exactly the reason that Tina's talking about. We're adding people who are find it extremely difficult to access the network now, who one might hope can gradually be brought into the global community, but this is another two pieces of, of the example. The place where IDNs are the most useful now are that if somebody in the US is naming a set of machines as Tom, dot, Tom Dick, and Harry dot some domain dot some TLD, uh, there are immense advantages if you happen to be in some place which is not in, which is not English speaking and Tom Dick and Harry are not natural strings to do that locally. And we're seeing tremendous use in third and fourth and fifth level domains within enterprises in various parts of the world of this machinery for that kind of mnemonic use. And I think that's extremely useful today and it's permanent. The other side of the equation Tina just mentioned is that that Arabic school child is going to have to type HTTP colon slash slash and then do a left to right to right to left switch and type some Arabic characters and then do a left to right and right to left switch and type a slash. And that's a nightmare. And that's one of the places where, as I say, my expectation is going to sort itself out in ways that are beyond the expectations of the strongest advocates of IDNs today. So you actually don't have to type that today, but if you want to do FTP, for example, then or you do. HTTPS. Yeah. Well, if you want the S on it, then you do. But for the <laughs> HTTP, you don't. But that's a, that's a technical standard problem. But I'm going to challenge you to go and see if you can type one of the Chinese addresses in, for example, if that's a language that you don't speak. See how difficult that is for you today. If you can figure out, if I'm going to supply you with an address that's Chinese characters that CN, for example. If you can figure out how to type that in, then I agree with you. Yes, but. Right. So uh, I'm going to tweak John for a moment, for just a moment, and then I've got a serious question. The tweaking is you use Tom, Dick, and Harry dot something as your example. There's an internet standard, for example, domain names. It's example.com, example.org, and it's actually written up. Just, <laughs> so it'd be a good standard for us. No, anyway, just teasing. Um, the more serious question, when you went, which I raised earlier, when you went through your discussion of where we ended up on the IDNN process, the interesting thing to me was that almost every branching point, every point you describe as a point of difficulty, maps to the problems that we had 15 years ago and going to 8-bit SMTP and internationalizing the content of email so people could write in their preferred languages in email. And what was interesting to me was that the internationalization of email took about 18 months roughly. Um, and, and yet you're describing with all the same problems, with all, many of the same actors in many respects. And yet in this case, we went... In the, for international domain names, we ended up with a solution that was not correct the first time around, whereas in email, we got it right when we finally did it. Um, and I'm wondering how much is that an evolution of the standards process in that we have added ever more parties and made it ever harder to do the things that we did. For example, during the email one, we ended up putting you in as SMTP czar, right? And, and is that no longer feasible? You know, Can you no longer dictate to a standards committee and say you have to decide on this and that's out of scope? Or is this just representing a harder problem space? Um, it's a harder problem space. Uh, the first thing which makes it a harder problem space is that with MIME and SMTP, we had levers on this. We could specify language and tags. We could specify, the, it may have been in retrospect, in, in many years retrospect a mistake, but we could specify the particular character set in use. Uh, we could use the SMTP model uh, to... Uh, to start negotiating extensions between a client and a server. Um, and perhaps most important of all relative to the comments I was making earlier, uh, we were perfectly willing to say to people, if, if you are non-conforming beyond this particular point, nobody made any promises to you and your life has just become miserable and that's too bad. Uh, this one is different for all of those reasons. We could have, and this is, you know enough about the DNS, 
uh, we, we could have gone the other path. Uh, we could have said, okay, this set of rules applies to label type zero and class IN. And uh, that's obsolete, and we have a transition strategy, and it's now label, class th label type three and uh, class something else. And now we're talking about a transition strategy, but when we get through, we've got an internationalized DNS. The first thing which made this different was that there was a great sense of urgency driven by political, external political pressures. Uh, and the people who designed IDNA and were pushing for that solution believed that we'd have this fully deployed around the world and fully supported in applications by three years ago. And we are not close, partly because of some other things. Uh, how long it would have taken to deploy that DNS solution I don't know, but it's harder than deploying DNS second. You know how long that's taken. Uh, if you don't do something that radical, you don't have any way to communicate into the DNS that one of these weird things is going on. And it affects all the applications across the board, not just SMTP, clients, servers, gateways, relays. So it's harder for all those reasons. In addition, with the SMTP stuff, Partly because the internet was much smaller in terms of interested parties, we didn't have quite as many people who thought that this was a cultural problem rather than a technical problem with, H with SMTP. As long as we solved it in some way that would work, they were happy. As I mentioned to somebody earlier, I spent a number of years of my life working on data about nutrient composition of foods. And one of the things we discovered about food naming and food nomenclature and recipes and food composition data is the number of people in the world who have opinions on those subjects are roughly equal to the number of people in the world who eat, ever. As soon as we've gotten into these my language, my culture, my spelling rules, arguments with the DNS, we're in a situation very close to that food problem. The number of people who think that they're entitled to have opinions, whether they know anything or not, is roughly equal to the number of people who use, who use the internet, plus a whole lot of people who don't use the internet but have opinions anyway. And that makes a very, very much more difficult context. I got a question. Why not just have Google front end IP addresses? <laughs> well, and I, so, I guess I had a question back here, and I uh, it just it's actually sort of a follow up, which is sort of what, what is the latest state of thinking about the like long term capacity of standards bodies to deal with these quasi political problems? And I say that with like sort of two dimensions to this. One is, you know, on the one hand, if you're taking on problems that arguably have this kind of policy dimensions, how do you make sure you have the right stakeholders in the room? Uh, and then this, but the other piece of it is how do you make sure that these you know, these, these bodies that arguably have been doing very well, like IETF over time, you know, within a certain approximation, you know, how do you survive the arrival of lobbyists? Um, I say that as a lobbyist for Google. Uh, and, um, and I'm thinking about the OOXML example, you know, for, as, as a good example, of, you know, political football, uh, political theater as a, as a problem for standards bodies. Uh, I think the first thing you do is you figure out how to tell the difference. And we're getting better at that, but not yet good at it. Uh, we're telling the difference is the difference between a technical argument or a technically grounded argument and somebody trying to use one of these arguments to advance either a particular agenda, particular narrow agenda, or uh, uh, narrow technical agenda, or, or, or a political agenda. Uh, knowing the difference helps. Uh, the other answer to that question is the light you see coming towards you in the tunnel is not a train, it's an ocean liner. I don't know. And the, the idea, recent idea and experience certainly doesn't lead me to be optimistic, although I assume that we will work it out. None of this is new. Um, uh, I mean, you can go back to uh, CIRSA, I think, uh, 1870, when they were arguing over the original digital code, which was Morse code versus the other codes available. Um, I think even uh, Rhonda Crane, as I recall at MIT, wrote a whole book on this on um, broadcast standards. So uh, you compartmentalize it and live with it. We used to break it. The idea of this hypothesis of breaking it was quite dramatic. <laughs> literally, literally, we just we, 
we, we, we have gotten less good at the version of rough consensus which involved taking somebody out behind the bar. <laughs> so you touched on uh, DNSSEC in one comment about how the difficulty of deployment, but I have a question that was brought up, and maybe it's a naive one, but um, with all these proliferation of internationalized uh, names that have these different characters and displays and all that stuff, I have the, you know, this concern about whether there's DNSSEC behind it and am I going to the right place or not. And if there's disparity in the deployment of this, but you know, if DNSSEC takes even longer, let's say, than we might expect, I would imagine uh, software to have options that say, well, just disable all this stuff. I don't want to even take the risk associated with it. Do you think that will happen? Is that uh, a the, the, the first answer is that some software has already done that. You just don't see it in an obvious way. Uh, the second is that for better or for worse, one of the advantages of IDNA is that the only thing in the DNS is stuff that to any piece of the DNS itself looks like letters, digits, and hyphens. And as a consequence, all of the difficulties here, the user-facing difficulties here, are invisible to DNSSEC, because as far as DNSSEC is concerned, this is just, you know, oct oct strings of octets with the usual expected stuff in them. Just, um, so in addition to that, um, just in case that there could be anything else going wrong. And I agree with John. I mean, it's just ledger digits and hyphens, so there wouldn't be any problems. But we actually signed um, the .test ID and TLDs that are in the root, and everything worked smoothly. I mean, there was no problems at all. But there's a difference between you signing it and then people verifying against that signature. I, yeah, I agree. And so and that test is not that broad. Yeah, and it's not, it's not a technical question about can the DNS processes do it. It's about out, out at the end software and at the end... Uh, you know, stuff, how people will react to it. At the end, one of the reasons why several of us have been pressing to get the mappings out of this thing is precisely because there's no way to verify with DNSSEC or anything else that the thing which was looked up is actually the same as the thing the user typed if somebody is invisibly underneath the user doing special things. Doing special things. But the strongest push for doing those mappings anyway, despite that problem, is coming out of this company as a consequence of trying to make certain that millions of web pages, which took advantage of that mapping stuff, will continue to work in an orderly and predictable way. This is a real tension. OK, I think in the interest of time, we're going to have to uh, thank you for all your questions and the panelists. It's, um, okay. Uh, hopefully the microphone works. Uh, I heard your description, your response to him saying, you know, how do you type HTTP, go from right to left, left to right. Turns out my wife actually surfs. Uh, she doesn't work here at Google. And not surprisingly, she's never typed HTTP in her life. So it was interesting that you were challenging these people to do things that my wife never does. There's an old saying that there's few problems for which one extra level of indirection won't offer a resolution. Uh, and he said it jokingly, uh, but it, it seems a little bit true. He, he commented, why don't you let Google front end? And, and the truth is, when my wife wanted to go look at a site, she actually didn't type dub, dub, dub. She didn't even do that part. She just typed Chase Bank. And magically, she got something that led her there. And, and the truth is, this is actually how people surf and get around. So I'm a little bit lost. I, do too. I don't think it has anything. I, so what? Yeah, I, no. But, but, okay. But, but that's exactly that next. Year. So, 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 what, I, so fundamentally, I think it was a, I think it was a false, I think it was a straw man that you set up there, and I'm, I'm really wondering, maybe I'm being incredibly no, arrogant here, you know. No, no. Actually, I said, you don't have to type HTTP. If you want the S on there, then you have to type it, but you no, don't no, type no. HTTP. No, you no. don't actually, because it turns out when I type Vanguard, it automatically redirects me because, and no one types, no, not no one. The real reason that, you're, that, that your wife is normal, and that those of us who actually know what a, U, what a URL looks like <laughs> are, are, are becoming an increasing rarity. And, and that every time a new top-level domain is added, it's more confusion about where to look if you're name-guessing. And what that does, as I said earlier, is basically cause people to go to the search engines, usually Google. To the extent to which people go to the search engines... This discussion about IDNs and the protocol work on IDNs 
is irrelevant. And that's good news. And, and, and good news for the community, not just for Google's bottom line. So it means that long term, the role of these things is much, much narrower than the assumption being made by the people who claim that if only they had IDNs, they'd have more people on the internet. This is going to end up being a very important niche, having more to do with network management and network resources than users typing names, I think. So I just want to clarify. I actually didn't say anything that was in disagreement with what you said. I, I said you don't have to type that in. Um, maybe if you do FTP, you do, but... Sorry, just since we're as we're stopping, I just wanted to ask why 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 we still need DNS in the browser. I mean, the, what Jim is talking about, what you mentioned, there's no need for DNS in the browser at all. Like, Yeah, can we can we leave that one to dinner conversation? Thank you.